Bible to the book of Galatians, chapter 3. Galatians 3. Continuing on for verses 15 through 22. And I need to apologize, there's no PowerPoint this morning. This week did not permit time for me to get that done, but uh, hopefully you did get an insert, and uh, I will do my best to call out clearly the blanks that uh, should be filled in there on your insert. All right. So has anybody ever made a promise to you and then broken the promise? We've probably all experienced that at least once, I would imagine, in this world. And let me ask it the other way. Have you ever made a promise to anyone that you broke, whether intentionally or unintentionally? Right? I think we've all probably had that experience as well. So our experience with promises may not be so great. We may be a little uncertain about that, uh, the reliability of that. And as we look into the Bible, we see that God has made promises to Israel and to the church. And again, our experience with promises may cause us to question maybe some of the promises that God has made, cause us to have a little doubt about that. See, promises may be made sincerely from a sincere heart, but they may be broken for a variety of reasons. One of those reasons may be that there's simply just a lack of resources on the part of the promiser, that he he or she is not able to meet the promise. Uh, Maybe they sincerely and genuinely wanted to do something for someone else, but they just weren't able. You know, if I was to tell you, I'm going to give each person here this morning $5,000 as they walk out the door shaking my hand. And I may sincerely mean that and intend to do that, but your question is, does he really have that much money to give away? And the truth is, I don't. So I'm sorry to disappoint you about that. Uh, But God, does God lack resources? No, he is the maker of all things. He is the sustainer of all things. Therefore, his resources have no limit. He spoke things, everything into existence out of nothingness. He lacks no resource. Another circumstance would be, another situation where a promise may be broken may be that uh, circumstances are beyond the control of the promiser. Right? Someone may make a promise to his family that uh, we're going to take a certain trip or go a certain place. And everyone's very excited, right, that first trip to Disney you know, that we've always wanted to make. And uh, then maybe, maybe the promiser, his employment situation changes in the meantime. And so he's unable to make that trip. Or maybe his health changes in the meantime, and he's unable to make that promise come to pass. But God is not at the, vic- at the mercy of any circumstances, is he? God is a sovereign God. God is a providential God. He he lacks no control over circumstances. Another area that may affect promise keeping is our forgetfulness. Right? Do you ever forget things? You know, especially as you get older, it's harder to remember things. I don't know about you, but I happy just raise his hand. Yeah. You know, they say as you get older, the memory is the second thing to go. I can't remember what the first one was. <laughs> but, but forgetfulness is a plague that we deal with as we get older. But does God ever forget? God never forgets. God is an omniscient, all-knowing God, and he never forgets. So his ability to keep promises is already far greater than ours, isn't it? Promises, though, may be made in a deceptive way, too, right? Some people may make promises to try to convince you or persuade you of something or to avoid certain trouble that you might find yourself in, and making a promise may feel like it will get you out of that difficulty. Uh, But there's often intentional deception that goes on when promises are made by some. When I was a kid, I remember others would be trying to persuade you of their truthfulness, and they would say, I swear on a stack of Bibles. 
that I'm telling the truth or that I will do this. Have you heard that before? Right? I swear on a stack of Bibles. Well, first of all, it depends what those Bibles mean to them. To us as believers, the Bible means something significant. To them, it may not mean anything at all, so they're not bound to that promise. Um, Or they make the promise, and then they go, oh, I had my fingers crossed. So it doesn't mean anything. This is what kindergarten kids do, right? It didn't mean anything. But God does not lie and deceive, does he? God is a God of truthfulness. He doesn't deceive us or lie to us. In fact, scriptures tell us that God cannot lie because it would go against his very character to lie. Other thing kids used to say when I was younger was, I cross my heart, I hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Right? Have you heard that one before or something similar to that? Well, I knew a lot of kids going around with a lot of needles in their eyes because there was a lot of false promises made, a lot of deception going on. Um, In the time of Jesus, there was this kind of deception as well. The Pharisees, they would, instead of swearing by God, they'd say, well, we swear by the temple, or we swear by the gold of the temple, right? Thinking that it's something lesser than God himself, and so the promise is less binding in some way. But really, at the heart of it is deception. It's deception. But God is not a God who is a deceiver. Um, God is a God who doesn't have to swear by other things because there's nothing greater than God to swear by, right? In fact, Hebrews 16, I'm sorry, Hebrews 6, 16 says, For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So they would swear by something greater as a way to try to demonstrate their truthfulness and that their intention to keep the promise. Um, But the same chapter there in verse 13 of Hebrews 6 says, When God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. He committed himself and his character to the fulfillment of the promise that he made to Abraham. And he does that with the promises to us as well. So God has promised us that our salvation is by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That is the promise, right? We've seen, again, the evidence of this goes all the way back to the book of Genesis to Abraham. And we heard it in the passage that Happy just read for us. Abraham believed God's promise and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And again, there were some in the churches of Galatia who were intentionally or unintentionally indicating that God's promise had changed somehow because the law needed to be kept, they thought, or they were trying to persuade others that that was the case. So in in doing that, they're indicating that the promise God made has somehow changed. They had a misconception about the law and about its significance. And Paul here, as we've been making our way into Galatians, he's been responding to this by arguing that God's promise has not changed. It has not changed in the slightest. Salvation is still by faith, and it's not by the works of the law. So let's take a look at our text here, Galatians 3, verses 15 through 22 for this morning, and please follow along as I read. Galatians 3, verse 15 through 22. To give a human example, brothers, even with man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterwards, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. 
For if the inheritance comes by the law, it, is no, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it would put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So let's take a look at this passage. And as we do, I want you to recognize three corrections to a misconception about the law. And you need to understand these misconceptions and these corrections so that you may receive the promise by faith in Jesus Christ instead of trying to maintain the law. So let's take a look at that first correction to the misconception of the law is that the law does not change the promise. The law does not change the promise. God's promise that believing is reckoned as righteousness hasn't changed at all. It not, has not changed in the slightest. And a couple reasons, again, that the law does not change the promise. Let's look at a couple reasons. First of all, even human covenants are not changed. Even human covenants are not changed. We see this in verse 15. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. So he says we're talking about spiritual things here, this relationship between man and God, but to help us understand that relationship, we need a more human example, something that's more familiar to us. And so, so he gives this picture, this illustration, to kind of clarify for his readers um, what he's intending to say here. And he focuses here on the idea of a man-made covenant, an agreement between people on earth. Um, we might think of this today as something like a contract. You would sign a certain contract, entering into an agreement, each side promising to uphold their side of the deal, of their agreement. And the idea of that being ratified, he uses that term ratified, that just means that it's finalized. All the terms are there, both sides have seen the terms, both sides understand the terms, they agree to the terms. And they both, in our day, they would sign the document. You know, if you're, if you're buying a house or you're taking out a loan or you're doing some other situation where, where there's paperwork, legal paperwork required, there's your signature on there is your agreement between you and the person on the other side of the table. So that's the ratification of that agreement or that covenant. And it says that nothing can cancel that. It's a legal document. Now, you can go to court, and if a person doesn't hold up their end of the deal, right, there are consequences and again, it may become a legal matter where you have to involve lawyers and so on and go to court. But the intention of those documents are that they are legal and binding and shall not be changed. And this is just on a human level. You don't change them. You don't add things to them. They are what they are. The agreement is ratified. The deal is set and established. And so what he's saying is, is on a human level, we know about this type of arrangement. We understand that once the deal is made, nothing is to change it. Nothing is to be added to it. That's clear to us. We understand that. And so he's saying here by talking about all of this, that if this is true of human arrangements, human contracts, human agreements, who are sinful humans... How much more true is it of a covenant made by God? That raises the standard, doesn't it? So this is the argument from the lesser to the greater, right? We, we see this and understand this on a human level. And if it's true of us, 
how much more true is it of God himself? And that's the first part of his argument here. The covenant that God has made with Abraham is something that is not to be broken. And especially God himself is not going to break it. If anybody's going to break it, it'll be from our side that we may try to break it. But God is not going to change. So this promise, though, like we said, is something that's more than a human covenant. It's more than a human arrangement because it's not between two people. In this case, it was between Abraham and God. So look at verse 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, because it's used in a singular. And to your offspring, who is Christ. That's interesting, isn't it? That's interesting. Where did Christ come from on a human level? Does he have a genealogy? If you were to look at the beginning of the book of Matthew, you see a genealogy. And uh, who is at the beginning of that genealogy? Well, Adam is, but they start, also talks about Abraham there, right? Talks about Abraham, and it traces down to who? Well, through David, and, and who comes near the end? Jesus himself. So there is a connection. So Christ is Abraham's offspring, okay? Christ is Abraham's offspring. So hold on to that idea here for a minute. Uh, but God made this promise to Abraham and to his seed, it says, his descendants, but in particular, focusing on Christ himself. So we have the father not only making a promise to Abraham, but a promise to Christ, his son. Okay? Now, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, we see a certain aspect, certain portion of the promise made. Okay? And if you also were to look at Genesis 13, Verses 14 through 17, you would see another portion of the promise made to Abraham. And then in chapter 15, which is where I'd like to draw your attention right now, um, which is what Happy read for us just before the message began, um, we see the, the, the fulfillment, not the fulfillment, but the ratification of this promise. So if we look at Genesis 15, starting at verse 9, we see God making a unilateral promise, essentially, to himself, that I will keep this promise, and I'm swearing by myself. I'm holding myself to this. Listen here again, Genesis 15, 9. So he says to Abraham, bring a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram uh, three years old, a turtle dove, a young pigeon. And he brought all of them, and he cut them in half and laid them over against each other, but he did not cut the birds in half. So he's preparing for a, for a ratification of this promise. And he takes these animals, and he cuts the animals in half, lays one half on each side, creating a path in the middle between the halves of animals. So this is a pretty gruesome scene. Now today, when we make a, a gentleman's promise, what do we do? We shake hands, right, as an agreement. Um, or we maybe, if it's a more serious deal, maybe we get a lawyer and we draw up a contract and we sign the contract. In this day, the covenant was made by sacrificing these animals, laying the half on each side with the path down the middle, and the two who are making the agreement together walk through this path of these dead animals as the shaking of hands or the signing of the contract. You say, well, why the dead animals? Well, the intention here is I am promising that I will uphold my end of the deal. And if I don't, can you fill in the blank? Let what happened to these animals happen to me. This is a serious deal. This is a serious deal. So keep going here. Look at verse 12, Genesis 15. It says, As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham. Maybe the pastor preached too long. And then he fell asleep. No. <laughs> and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And then the Lord said to Abram, 
Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. And they will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. So who are the descendants he's talking about here? The Israelites, right? And they're in slavery in Egypt. And it was a 400-year slavery that was there. So he is telling them about this way in advance, that this is going to happen. And as we look at the scriptures, we see that it happens. It's recorded in the book of Exodus for us. Now look at verse 17 of Genesis 15. It says, When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. Where's Abraham? He's still sleeping. He's out. Who passed through the path? It was and it was symbolic of God passing through the path by himself, holding himself to the covenant. Abraham's over there asleep. God made a promise to himself to do this, that he would bless Abraham and his offspring. Verse 18, And on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates, and so on. And he describes the geography, the boundaries of that geography that he's promised to him. God promised to Abraham, and he held himself to the promise. It's a unilateral covenant that he made. But he didn't only promise to Abraham. He promised to his offspring. And we know that his offspring, it goes Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, right? The the patriarchs of the nation of Israel and the descendants that came from them. But it traces down to Christ. Now notice it wasn't all of Abraham's sons because he had another son named what? Ishmael. Does this promise apply to Ishmael and Ishmael's descendants? No, it doesn't. It doesn't apply to them. And it doesn't apply to all who are Jewish It doesn't apply to all either. Just because you can trace your genealogy back to Abraham, supposedly, doesn't mean that you're part of this promise. Um, But it was made to the line where Christ would come. So Romans 4, either look there or just jot it down. Romans 4, look at verse 13. He says, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world, did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For, it, for if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null, and the promise is void. It means nothing. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there's no transgression. That is, why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and the guarantee to all his offspring, not only adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is father of us all. If you believe in Christ as your Savior, the same way Abraham believed, then Abraham, you are a descendant of Abraham. Not genealogically, biologically, but spiritually, you are a child of Abraham. Which means the promise is something you will partake of as well. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Look at verse, I'm sorry, Galatians 3.29 says, and if you are Christ's then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. That'll be next week's passage as we get into that section. So we see where this fulfillment is going. Okay, It's not just Abraham, it's his descendants, but it's not just his biological descendants, it's his spiritual descendants. And if we believe in Christ, and if we are in Christ, because because Christ is the, the pinnacle of Abraham's seed or offspring, and if we're in him, The promise comes to us as well. Okay? Uh, It's it's, it's interesting, isn't it? 
Have you thought about that? Have you recognized that before? There's another interesting passage in 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Either jot that down or take a look. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, and 13. <clears throat> For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Now he's talking about a human body having different members, different parts, arms, legs, feet, toes, fingers, eyes, ears, nose, right? The body has different members, different parts. And he said, the same is with Christ. There, it's all one body. It's different parts, but it's all one body. So there's a, a single singularity there, a oneness there. And he says, so it is with Christ. Verse 13, for if in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jew or Greek, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. We become one with Christ through faith in him, through being immersed into him. And therefore, we share in all of the inheritance that Christ has been promised through Abraham as his offspring, singular, and we are part of that singular offspring as those who are in Christ. That's amazing. That's an incredible blessing for us to have that position. And we didn't have to do any work to earn that. In fact, there's no work that we could do to earn that. There were no laws to keep that gain that for us because Abraham was asleep and God committed himself to the fulfillment of that promise. Wow. That's staggering to think about. Consider how unworthy we know we are of receiving anything from God. But we, through faith, when we believe faith is reckoned to us as righteousness, we become one with Christ, we become joint heirs with Christ. We inherit what he's been promised to inherit. If that's not something to praise the Lord for, you must be half dead. Right? That's an amazing thing. It's an incredible thing. So let's go to a second reason here that the law does not change the promise. A second reason. And I'm going to have to pick up the pace here a little bit. Galatians 3.17 says... This is what I mean, that the law, which came 430 years afterwards, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. So our second reason is God's covenant or promise made with Abraham predates the law. By 430 years, it predates the law. And so if that contract, that promise has been made already, how can something that comes 430 years later change that? Human contracts aren't changed. Why would God's change? If you had a human contract and 430 years later someone comes right from your, from your ancestors and they want to change it now, the law wouldn't, wouldn't uphold that. Things that come later can't change things that have already been established, especially for over 400 years. So that's his second argument here. And uh, in Genesis 15, again, verse 13, right, he talks about the people of Israel being slaves for 400 years. Now, the promise, so he's talking about the time between, between um, the, the promise made, I'm sorry, the promise made to Abraham and the um, time that the Israelites are released from Egypt. And actually, it's, it's more than 400 years. It's closer to uh, 640 years or 45 years between Abraham and the release from Egypt. So you say, oh, well, the Bible made a mistake. Well, but remember, who was that promise also made to? If you look through the book of Genesis, if you read through that, it's made to Abraham. And who is it passed on to? Isaac. And who is it then passed on to? Jacob. Right? And the last recording we have in Genesis of the promise is referring to Jacob. 
So if they're counting from Jacob to the time the Israelites come out, now the 430 works. See, it's the same promise through the same line. And God is fulfilling that promise. So, again, the law cannot change or add to or modify in any way that already ratified promise, that covenant that's already been established. He made an unconditional promise to Abraham. There's nothing Abraham has to do to keep that except just believe that God has promised it and God will fulfill it. We don't do anything to earn our salvation. We simply believe that the scriptures teach us that God sent his son to die on the cross for the sins of all who would believe. And if you recognize yourself as a sinner in need of rescue, and you turn to Christ believing that his death will pay for your sin if you will believe in him and trust in him, then you're forgiven of your sin. And it's not on you to earn that or on you to maintain that. It's all on Christ who died on behalf of all who would believe. Any more amens to that? That's an amazing thing. See, the law does not make God's promise void. It doesn't. It came 430 years later. It doesn't change anything. The Mosaic Covenant, the Mosaic Law, was a series of blessings for obedience and cursings for disobedience that applied to the nation of Israel, right? And we saw those things carried out. We saw, we saw the nation of Israel, after coming out of Egypt, suffer many curses, because of their continual, repeated disobedience to God. But that's a separate issue from the fact that God has promised that they will have the land, that that will be fulfilled, and that, the, that all Israel, who is real Israel, will be saved. All of them will be saved. That's a totally separate deal. God gave them the law to cause them to be different, than the nations around them. And God gave them the law to make them aware of their own sin that they might humble themselves and turn to God for forgiveness. So the basis of the inheritance has not changed at all. Look at verse 18 of Galatians 3. Verse 18. For if the inheritance comes by the law, then it no longer comes by a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise, not by the law, by a promise. The inheritance has nothing to do with the law. He gave it as a promise. In fact, it's interesting. You think about this. We tend to think of the Old Testament as the age of law, and the New Testament is the age of grace, right? That's how we tend to think of these things. But in reality... In reality, the Old Testament, beginning with Abraham, prior to the captivity, right? It is the age of promise. It's the age of promise. And afterwards, when Christ comes, it is the age of grace. And so we have this little parenthesis in the middle where law was given to Israel. So that's really the odd part of it, the, the unusual part. It starts with a promise and it ends with grace. There's some law in the middle. We tend to think of just halves, but really the law is sandwiched by grace and by promise, which is how God has always operated. And God has always fulfilled the promise through the time of law, and he's always redeemed people by grace even through the time of law. So that brings us to our second correction of a misconception of the law found in Galatians 3, 19 and 20. And it starts off, it says, well, why then the law? Right? Why the law? 
if this is how it really works, why the law? And he says it was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary, not an intermediary. Now, intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. So our second correction is the law serves a different purpose than the promise. The law serves a different purpose than the promise did. Right? And when Paul makes that statement, you know, well, then why was the law given? He said, what's the purpose? Why is there a law in the first place? Well, a couple reasons. A couple reasons here. First of all, the law was added because of transgressions. It was to make sin known. It was to draw people's attention to the fact that they are sinful but they're disobedient. And it was to bring their eye to that issue, to that problem. Because Romans 4.15 says, the law brings wrath, but where there's no law, there's no transgression. So there's no law, I don't know what I've done wrong. Romans 4.15. And Romans 5.20 says, now the law came to increase the trespass. The law came to make you aware of of how sinful sin really is. And that sin is not just actions that you commit. It's also words that you say. It's also attitudes and thoughts that you harbor in your heart. We see Jesus reaffirm this in his Sermon on the Mount when he says, you've heard it said, whoever commits murder is liable to the court, is guilty. But I say to you, there's more to this than just externally murdering someone. He says, I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother, and he's holding that anger and bitterness against someone, that that person is also liable to the court and guilty. Because that's the roots of the murder. It's not just the action, it's the heart attitudes behind it. And he says the same thing about adultery. You should not commit adultery. And the Pharisees would say, well, we haven't. We have never been involved with another woman who is not our wife. And they had come up with all kinds of ways of getting, trying to get around that issue. But, but in particular, he said, Jesus says, but I say, whoever looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in his heart. And the issue is far more than just the actions. It also includes the heart. And if we say, well, I've never murdered, I've never committed adultery, I've never robbed a bank, I've never done these things, well, maybe you haven't, and that's good, but that doesn't mean you're not a sinner. Let's look at your heart. Let's look at the anger in your heart. Let's look at the lust in your heart. Let's look at the other things that are going on there. And so the law comes to begin to make us more aware of our sin to make us more aware of how sinful we truly are. Second reason, the law was added until the offspring should come. Until the offspring should come. Again, the offspring referring to here is who? Christ. We're waiting for him to come. We're waiting for him to return. And when he returns the second time, promises will start to be fulfilled. Right? Right? Promises are going to be fulfilled. So we look forward to that day. So the law was a temporary thing to prepare us for when Christ comes, when he returns. Because it says in Romans 10.4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. You can't be righteous by, by turning to the law. It has to come through Christ. How many of you here this morning know Christ as your Savior? How many of you have really examined your heart? You don't have to put your hand up. I'm not asking for that. I'm just asking for you to think about that. You can come to church, and you can sit in these nice chairs, and you can carry, even carry a Bible around. And you can stand up and sing the songs and sit down and listen to the message and do those different things, and you can be a nice, polite person. But those things in themselves don't necessarily make you a Christian. Those things in themselves don't necessarily mean that you know Christ as your Savior. 
Now, if you do know Christ as your Savior, you'll be doing those things, but there'll be a lot more going on than just that external practice. There'll be a personal relationship with him. We need to examine our hearts and say, am I going through the motions trying to do the things that Christian people expect me to do so that I look like a Christian? And I'm gaining platitudes from others who are saying, oh, look what a good Christian they are. All they can see is the external. We need to look at what's going on in our hearts and say, Lord, I may fool other people. I may even fool myself sometimes. But Lord, I know what's in my heart. You know what's in my heart. Please forgive me for those things. Please help me to seek to repent of those things and to follow you and to live my life for you, not for me and what I can gain for myself. Because all that's temporary. That may seem nice in the moment. But what about eternity? What about eternity? If you know him, you're one with Christ, and you are a joint heir to receive inheritance with Christ. And I pray that's where all of you will be if you're not already there. And we're going to have to save the rest for next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your promises that are reliable. Your promises to Abraham, which you are fulfilling and will fulfill. We thank you for the promises that we have in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we we praise you. We thank you. We don't deserve this, but you have been gracious to us. You have made a unilateral promise with yourself and a promise to Christ, your Son, that you will give him an inheritance. And that inheritance is not just castles and mansions and wealth, but that inheritance is a, is a church, is a body of believers. Christ is the head of that body, and we who are believers are members of that body. And you will bless us through being immersed into him. Lord, I, I thank you for this incredible blessing, and I pray for those who don't know Christ, that you would draw them to yourself, that they may be, by faith, recipients of the same inheritance through Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.